you this evening about something that I started working on roughly 35 years ago, which is the growth of government uh, in the United States in particular. Uh, at that time, I was a faculty member at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I had a colleague there named uh, Douglas Nora. And uh, <coughs> Doug was already a well-known man in academia and, and went on to even bigger things later, uh, receiving the Nobel Prize in, in economics. Uh, I think 1994, but uh, at that time, uh, Doug was the department chairman, and uh, he's the man who hired me, and we were both economic historians, and I spent a lot of time in his office, practically every day, and they were talking to him and arguing with him. In those days, he was, uh, he was considered the, uh, the authority among economic historians in the interrelationship of the government and the economy in U.S. history, and uh, I, I had not done any research in that area, but I did teach courses, and so I, I had to deal with the subject uh, as a normal part of my teaching, and was doing the usual reading that uh, the economic historians did, and as a result, I found myself differing with my colleague and, various respects, and so we did a lot of arguing with one another about the growth of government. And finally, around 1981 or so, I decided that uh, I might know enough to write a small book uh, where I would lay out my ideas, and so they would be out there for people to compare with Doug's and other people's uh, who were writing the same area at the time. This, this field became something of a cottage industry for economists in the late 70s, 80s, uh, and uh, then political scientists began to work along similar lines, and so eventually it became uh, a substantial body of research and publication. But uh, at the time I started, uh, not too many people were engaged, and I thought I had something to say with my little book. My little book turned out to be bigger than I thought, because when I went around talked about at different universities that people would object to various aspects of my ideas. And so I would have to go back and extend the book or revise it and try to take into account problems that people saw. And ultimately, uh, what came out of all this was a book published in 1987 called Crisis of Leviathan, uh, Critical Episodes of the Growth of American Government. And at the time, I, I actually thought that uh, that this would be the first of what might eventually be five or six books, each one better than the preceding one in this area, but fate was lying in wait for me. And uh, even though I did quite a bit of writing later, I, I never did write that series of books, each one better than uh, that first one uh, in this field. And so it's, it's dogged me ever since it's been almost <laughs> 30 years now since its publication, but uh, very often when people ask me to come and speak, that's what they want me to talk about, this thing that to me is really quite old news at this point. But uh, nevertheless, it's a very important topic. It, it's never stopped being important. I, uh, I, I think more people need to spend some time thinking about it and studying it. Because, in fact, uh, the United States, along with a number of other countries in the world, is caught up now uh, in a process of uh, a growing government. Government continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger in most parts of the world. Not all, but, but most, uh, and certainly in the, most of the advanced economies like those of Western Europe, and the offshoots of Europe overseas, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth. So this is, this is a problem, it's, a, it, it's a, a process that cannot continue forever. And I'll, I'll say more about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, because it can't continue forever, uh, people need to give thought to how it's going to stop, much less turn around. And uh, the conference we're having here, and talk, talking to one another about tomorrow privately, uh, is concerned particularly with questions of 
of that. What might happen uh, to prevent a very serious catastrophe when the process stops, or uh, if uh, those uh, disasters should happen, what comes next? What can be done at that point? What ought to be done? But for now, I want to first start off by giving you an idea of what I may want to talk about the growth of government. Uh, government is multifaceted. Government is not a thing like a person's height or weight that we can measure unambiguously and track over time the way we track uh, one of our children as, as he gets taller and we make a mark on the wall each time we, we uh, see how, how tall he is now. Uh, government has so many different dimensions that, that uh, it's, it's almost impossible to speak coherently about the size of government or the rate of growth of government. And uh, in particular, uh, we can distinguish three important categories of government, each one of which can be measured in a multitude of ways. First is just the size of government, which we might measure by how much money government spends, how many people it employs, uh, how much tax revenue it takes in, and so forth. Uh, that's a very common way, and you, you've all encountered discussions of the size of government in the news media along those lines. Uh, we might also talk not about the size of government, but about its scope, which is the concept of how far reaching its controls and influence in the world are. Does it concern itself uh, just with uh, things like national defense or the protection of property rights, uh, or does it go much farther and concern itself with uh, how many gallons your toilet tank can have, uh, what words you may not ask a potential employee in an interview, and a million other things that government now uh, does or insists that we do on, on behalf of compliance with government dictates and regulations. So there's the question of scope, the different things that government is involved in in some way. And finally, there's the question of power. Uh, how much force does the government possess to bring to bear against people that don't comply with its edicts, that don't pay the taxes requested of them, uh, or how much force does it have to fend off foreign enemies or other threats? So there are many dimensions of force, just as there are many dimensions of government size and scope. So one of the things that's, that's for sure for anyone who investigates the subject is he's going to be criticized by people who say, well, you looked at this aspect of government, but you neglected that. Well, I, I confess right at the outset that that's the case in my work, and, but it has to be the case. No one can cover all of this enormous ground. We, we now live in a country where government is involved, intimately involved, uh, in practically everything we can think of. Now, that was not always the case. I'm sure everybody here has probably uh, been exposed to some, some American history, either in uh, school or college, perhaps just in your own reading. So you know that after the American Revolution, when the government of the United States became independent, uh, it was indeed quite a small, limited affair. The number of executive departments in the federal government under Thomas Jefferson was four. That's the uh, war, uh, they had the Navy Department, State Department, Treasury Department. That was it. There was an Attorney General, but there was no Department of Justice, so he was basically on his own. The Attorney General, I don't know if he even had a secretary. But uh, now if you, if you look at how many federal departments there are, there are, I'm not sure how many now, several dozen at least. And in addition, there are countless agencies of the government some of them known as independent regulatory agencies or uh, government-sponsored entities, uh, 
government entities come in all kinds of shapes, some advisory, some very much uh, active and policy making. So once again, we see that not only has government expanded in terms of its uh, 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 of its spending, taxing, and employing, but it's uh, it's become so complex that I found uh, I could not find any authoritative list of the number of even federal regulatory agencies now in existence. It's certainly in the hundreds, but no one I located was willing to say, it's this many. And they all express caveats about the difficulty of identifying what the agencies are and what their powers are and so forth. So that muddies the water even further. Um, here's the, the most common way of measuring the size of government. Uh, in this case, I've started out early in the 20th century and come up to a fairly recent year. And uh, what we have here is the, the amount of government spending, in this case, all levels of government, uh, compared to the size of the gross domestic product. And what you see is if you go back to the early 20th century, that ratio was about 7%. Relative to the economy, government, all governments together uh, before World War I were not insignificant, but very, very much smaller than they are today. Uh, and in those days, the, the biggest part of government was local government. Federal government was not the big gorilla that it became after the 1930s. That's when the switch took place. So what we have here is a showing that we've gone from a 7% ratio to one in the neighborhood of 40% as we come up to the present. This, by the way, although it's the most common way to measure the size of government, and therefore to look at its growth over time, is not the best way to in fact, it's systemically flawed uh, in ways that uh, are easy to spell out. So I encourage you to read the next issue of the Independent Review, or I have a small paper spelling some of these things out. But uh, some of that I've been doing for 30 years uh, as well. In my book I mentioned, I do a certain amount discussing that question of uh, how to best measure the growth of government. But this is one way, and, and you see not only that the trend has been upward over the long term, uh, but you see also that this was not a steady process. Uh, there were periods when there were great leaps or spikes uh, in the size of government, and uh, the, the most notable ones are associated with the two world wars, uh, the onset of the Great Depression, and 1930s uh, and the the beginning of the Korean War, uh, when the government became much bigger uh, very quickly as uh, American troops were sent to fight in Korea. Uh, but most of that military buildup at that time, even though it was correlated with the onset of the Korean conflict, was not uh, forces for Korea. It's really forces for Europe and the administration, the Truman administration, been trying to get Congress to approve more resources for European defense and had not succeeded, but used the pretext of the Korean War as a way to justify a much higher level of military spending, most of which was actually employed in Europe. So that's, a, that's typical in the sense that crises, whether they're economic or military uh, or some other kind, uh, provide pretext for people in power to do things that they've wanted to do for quite a long time, uh, but have not been able to do because of political opposition. And uh, the configuration of forces pushing one way and pushing back the other way in politics tends to keep most uh, proposals uh, unsuccessful or, or to trim them down. And so it's very difficult for people to make big pushes 
that all the big pushes in our history have been associated with national emergencies. Here we see something else interesting about the long-term growth of government, and that is the extent to which debt has been uh, has become characteristic of modern governments. Uh, as you see, the government always took on a lot of debt when it went to war. Uh, it was not able to raise enough tax revenue to uh, field the respectable military forces when it went to war, uh, either in the Revolutionary War, the uh, the War of uh, 1812, uh, the Civil War, certainly in the case of the World Wars even. Uh, so the debt jumps up, but, but it, throughout the 19th century, and indeed even up to 1929, the tendency was for those big debt soldiers to be paid down <coughs> after the war ended. And so you see the spikes followed by a gradual reduction in the federal debt level, and uh, even uh, on the eve of World War I, uh, the federal government's debt was, was about $1 billion. Think of that. $1 billion. It's now $18 trillion. So <laughs> you can do the math. Uh, it was insignificant before World War I. It's highly significant now. And the other thing you'll see is that even though after World War II, the debt ratio came down. It did that not because the debt itself was retired, but because it was not increased very much while the economy grew. And, and we've not reached the point where even that doesn't work anymore. We just have a government which runs at big debts on the slightest pretext or none at all. And we're now looking at a situation projected there on the right-hand side of the chart where even barring any crisis in the future, the debt will, will assume enormous proportions. You can't read that, I know, but I put it up because it's an organization chart for the federal government. I mentioned there were four departments when Jefferson was president. Well, now you can see from those boxes in the middle there, there, there are a lot of them. And below there are a bunch of government uh, creating entities of one kind or another. Which, only scratch the surface of the total number. This is a stylized version of a hypothesis I use in my work, have used since my first book. It's called the ratchet phenomenon, or the ratchet effect. What it shows us is that we can have a government that's either growing or not growing, but it's the behavior of government in a normal situation. And then a crisis comes along, and the government suddenly lurches to a much higher level in response to the uh, demand, as it were, that it act in a way that will allay the perceived threat. When a war begins, when a depression starts, people become very fearful. They're more likely to turn to the government, at least under modern ideological conditions, they're more likely uh, to turn to the government. And politicians are usually ever so glad to respond to that demand and uh, reluctantly take on more power. So uh, we have the typical lurch upward, uh, the onset of a national emergency in the size, scope, and power of government. And then when the crisis ends, we have a retrenchment. But the retrenchment is always incomplete. And some of the actions taken during the crisis continue to be taken. Some of the powers gained during the crisis are never surrendered. Uh, some of the fiscal dimensions the government has taken on remain. It, it goes forward with a big additional debt, for example, or it, it has raised taxes during a war, and then when the war is over, it never puts taxes back to the level they were before the war, and uh, this has been very important in our history. Uh, world War II was the great uh, fiscal leap because that's when the income tax system, along with withholding of uh, tax payments by employers, was put into effect, and it's been in effect ever since. This was an emergency program that's now been in existence since I was two years old. As you can see, I'm, I'm well along now. So, this has been going a long time. 
And, and it's not going to stop as far as we can see. The government's going to continue to rake in taxes from uh, scores of millions of people routinely and at high rates uh, for many of them. Those high rates also came into existence during World War II when the top federal income tax rate got up to 94%. So if you were Rockefeller or somebody in that income range and you made another dollar, you had to hand over 94 cents of it to the U.S. Treasury. And if you think, well, that kind of took all the fun out of earning another dollar, your, your head's in the right place. There are incentive effects to high taxation of, of, of a number of kinds that discourage people from working, from saving, and from investing. But now, high taxes and taxes that are comprehensive that are levied widely in the population have become the norm owing to their use as emergency institutions in particularly the war times of the 20th century. What we have then after the crisis is a re re resuming of normal growth of government, uh, but it's resumed from a higher level. Now, if you imagine a historical process like the one of the past hundred years where there have been several big crises, and every one of them has a ratchet effect, what you find is that you have now reached a stopping point where we are today, not a stopping point, but that that's the present position, and, and it's much higher than it would have been if government had continued to go along that same trajectory that's following, let's say, between 1900 and 1914. Every crisis shifts it up when the dust is settled to a higher level. So over the long term, the government gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes this leviathan, it tells us how to build our toilet tanks, what color to paint our houses, and all the rest of it. This, uh, these data show us uh, some federal outlays per capita adjusted for inflation uh, since the Truman administration. Uh, you see, the first year of Truman's administration was the last World War II year, so that, that's a very high level there. But once we got past World War II, uh, we've gone into a, a, a process which clearly is not partisan. This is not something you can point to the Democrats and say, the Democrats did it, or point to the Republicans and say, the Republicans did it. Every administration, regardless of party, uh, has, uh, has on average raised the level of federal outlays per capita in real terms. This kind of growth of government is now built into the very structure of the government's operation. And that's why I said when I started my talk that it's going to result in disaster because the current system cannot, will not make the decisions required to stop it and certainly not required to reverse it. So they're gonna continue as long as they can kick the can to keep this process going, keep doing the things that their supporters want them to do, even though for the society and the economy at large, they are verging on disaster already. Here's another measure uh, where we look here at the payments to individuals. This is uh, transfer payments. Government didn't make a lot of transfer payments before the 20th century. It pretty much made them to veterans, and that was it. But uh, in the 20th century, and particularly since uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal, uh, transfer payments have become an increasingly important part of all government activity, especially government spending. And so we now find that we've, we've, we've got more than $2 trillion here being given to people in the form of payments uh, or, or gifts of goods and services uh, without anything in exchange. The government sometimes buys goods and services. If it wants a fighter plane, it goes to Lockheed Martin, hands them the money, and uh, gets a fighter plane back. It takes 30 years to do it, it's true, but uh, 
because you get you get the player playing back ultimately. Uh, in the case of transfer payments, the government hands over the money and it doesn't get anything in return. Uh, grandma gets the social security check, and in that deal, the government doesn't get anything. Uh, people get disability insurance benefits, the government gets nothing. They get unemployment insurance benefits, the government gets nothing. And this has become a tremendously important, bigger and bigger relative part of the government, which is itself growing bigger over time. So those are dimensions, and what I want to in, insist upon in the few minutes I have left here it, it is to re repeat that clearly the growth of government is now built into the very structure of how governments at every level operate in this country. Now, we know just from looking at a single program, uh, Medicare, that the amount of payments reasonably projected to be made by Medicare will, in not very long, become more uh, payments than the government can afford to make. And that's just one area where this situation exists. At the state and local levels, pensions are much the same. State and local governments have promised lavish pensions and post-retirement health care to their former employees. And now those payments are eating up budgets at state and local levels, increasing them. Uh, no one wants to relent. No one wants to give back. Uh, every individual fights to get what he can as long as he can get it. And politicians are reluctant to buck important interest groups, such as the elderly who want those Social Security payments, and they want them increased to keep up with the inflation. Uh, state and local government retirees, they're an important group. School teachers, they're an important group. There are lots of interest groups that are right in there uh, having the ear of politicians all the time, insisting that they, they don't want to sacrifice, they want somebody else to do it. But that's the same position everybody takes. And it's impossible to satisfy everybody. So the government uh, uses smoke and mirrors, it promises uh, heaven to everybody, uh, but you know, nobody wants to be righteous to get to this heaven. So this is our situation right now. We've got a government that's growing in a way that cannot continue. It's got to stop. What can't happen won't happen. So the only question is how it's going to stop. How much pain is going to be caused? Who's going to be hurt the most? Who's going to be disappointed the most? Because unfortunately, Americans have become uh, like spoiled children. They think if they don't get more every year of some government benefit, uh, that their benefits are cut. Politicians like to talk about the budget that way, the programs that way. They project growth, and then when that growth is trimmed, even by itsy bitsy bit, they talk about cuts, slashes, terrible reductions in government services and funding. Uh, but it's nonsense most of the time. If you were to go back to 1950, which I can recall, and I recall the country that was pretty civilized, pretty well off as countries go, uh, yet the government of those days was almost negligible compared to the government now, and yet people were not dying in the streets. I don't know what you've been told by your history teachers. I never saw anybody dying in the streets when, when I was a boy. So there's a lot of screaming and yelling of government beneficiaries. They have the ear of politicians. Politicians don't want to disappoint people that can vote for somebody else the next time around. And so we, we keep this thing going and going and going. Uh, but it must stop. And if I had another 40 minutes, I could perhaps give you some of the ways in which I think it's going to stop. But uh, my time is up and I'll stop right here. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm <laughs> sorry.
Thank you.